Good evening, everyone. It's a great, uh, great to see so many people, and what makes me especially happy is to see so many students. Um, this is the third one of these President's Forums that we've done, and this is the first one where the majority of the audience actually is students. So I love that. That makes me happy. So welcome to everyone. A special welcome to, we have many members of our professional staff and our faculty here as well tonight, and we have one of our Board of Trustees members, Fran Gerard. so a special shout out for Fran and her husband, Art. Those of you that drive by on Hills Beach Road and see our Marine Sciences Center um, will see that it's named the Gerard Marine Sciences Center, and it's named after these folks who are the ones who endowed that center. They also, Ram Island, our very own island just off the shore where we do all of our experiments and clinical and education around uh, marine and environmental studies, they're the ones that gave us that island. So how cool is it to have in our audience people who gave us an island? So, um, thank you very much. So thank you all for joining us tonight. It's no secret that we're living in a very interesting time, a time when there's been a breakdown in dialogue and, and discussion in our society. We live in these increasingly isolated, self-isolated um, social media bubbles, um, whether it's social media or Google algorithms, polarization, people screaming at each other on cable TV, um, these sort of scream fests. It's getting harder and harder to have places where we can have real conversations about important, timely, and even controversial topics that are productive and yet civil. We have to address this as a society, and universities are really the place where that should happen. We should be leading those kinds of conversations. In fact, we must do that. Last fall, I was honored to give my first TED Talk, and it was on this topic. And some of you may have seen it, but it was on the topic of universities being the marketplace of ideas, the places where we have these kinds of difficult conversations. So at UNE, we have lots of lecture series. The Center for Global Humanities Lectures, the Merrill Lecture, the Bush Lecture Series, and we invite perspectives from across the ideological spectrum. But all of these traditional lecture formats provide limited opportunities for a real exchange of ideas. And that's why we created the President's Forum. This was an event that I started here along with our colleagues in, uh, on the faculty um, my first uh, year here at UNE. And the basic idea is a moderated discussion amongst people who might have a different perspective on a particular issue. And the last one we held, for example, was on guns and gun control. So we talk about a controversial topic. Um, but we, we try to find interesting topics that are widely applicable and, and under discussion, but that we can have a robust conversation about. So tonight, we're going to talk about climate change. And specifically, we're going to talk about a specific issue within climate change, and that is, is it ethical to profit from climate change? So we gather on the very day today that the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has convened leaders from across the world in New York for the 2019 Climate Action Summit. And you may know that our own governor, Janet Mills, actually addressed that assembly um, today. As our world's governments and business leaders all seek to address what the UN considers a global climate emergency. So we're going to talk about one particular topic within the larger sub subject of climate change, and this is something that's of a lot of importance to many of us um, here, to many of you, the students, and the faculty and professional staff. It's also a hot topic internationally. Um, and uh, through our own Institute for North Atlantic Studies, UNE North, we're going to be presenting a similar discussion at the up upcoming Arctic Circle Assembly in Reykjavik, Iceland, next month. So as the effects of climate change have become more apparent. We've seen catastrophic disruptions around the world, but we've also seen unprecedented economic opportunities. So for example, there are profits to be made from new trade routes opening up to the, in terms of Arctic shipping lanes to China and elsewhere. Um, we have private firefighting companies are being hired to protect rich folks' homes as wildfires rage. We have opportunities for water desalinization plants as drought spread. Um, we have contractors specializing in raising and waterproofing houses in flood zones. Um, we have the possibility of harvesting uh, crops in areas that were once covered by ice. Um, the possibility of newly arable land in Greenland and elsewhere. So these opportunities raise many questions, but one critical dilemma stands out. 
How do we reconcile the profit motive with the actions needed to fight climate change when they are in conflict? So this applies to both industry as well as nation states alike. For example, let's imagine that you're the CEO of a shipping company, right? And you are incentivized because to, to pursue new shipping routes to China over the Arctic. And as both the Northeast and the Northwest passages become more open for longer periods of the year, eventually perhaps the entire year, with Arctic mel melting, by using these new shipping routes, you have greater profit for your company. So these CEOs that take advantage of that, they may very well acknowledge global warming, they may decry it, they may say that it's a bad thing, but at the same time, they're now profiting from it. And it's literally, quite literally, good for business. And those CEOs have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to maximize profits. So how do they take advantage of these new trade routes and the opportunities they, they present without creating a perverse incentive, not only not to fight climate change, but in fact, perhaps to do something that would even hasten climate change, because after all, it's good for business. Now, they may appreciate these CEOs that in the long run, that would be catastrophic, but in the short run, but businesses, if you're a CEO, you have to report to your shareholders quarterly, right? And so you have to look out for the short and the medium term, not so much the long term. And the CEO might rationalize that if, that, hey, somebody's going to profit from this, somebody's going to take advantage of these shipping lanes, and if it's not me, it'll be the Russians or it'll be somebody else who will even do it in a less sustainable way, so we might as well forge ahead. What's a good CEO to do? So with some modifications, that same logic, logic could apply to an indigenous farmer in Greenland who is looking to expand Greenland's nascent agricultural uh, industry, industry, I'm not sure that's the right word, but agricultural activity in newly arable lands, which is actually happening, is going on. So lest we just focus on the big bad CEO, the same logic applies to the farmer, the native uh, indigent farmer in, in Greenland or elsewhere. So in Maine, we frequently talk about our position as the, the gateway to the new north and we talk about the opportunities afforded to Maine businesses and industry that are opened up by climate change. We often, and typically, in fact, we begin that conversation with the obligatory remark about climate change being a bad thing. In a way, this reminds me of some of my southern kin who use that expression, bless her heart. You know, you say, bless her heart, and then you can say whatever you want to say, get down to the real business, right? And it's kind of like as long as we say, oh yeah, climate change bad, then we can jump in and say what we really want to say in terms of um, economic development. So as these examples that I've outlined illustrate, taking advantage of climate change, which seems inevitable, will often create disincentives from doing anything about it, and in fact, create perverse incentives to hasten it. So tonight, we're going to solve that problem, I'm sure. These guys are going to figure it out and, and solve this problem, and uh, we're going to, but in, seriously, we're going to explore various perspectives on this issue. It's totally fine if we disagree, as long as we are respectful in the process of disagreeing. There will be a, an opportunity for everyone to participate. In fact, we want to encourage audience participation, so there will be a Q&A uh, uh, time whenever, at various times throughout the talk, when you can ask questions or say your, your piece. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to introduce our guests. We have three very special guests tonight. Our first guest is Benjamin Ford. Ben is a partner at the Verrill Law Firm in Portland, right here locally. Uh, Mr. Ford helps, he helped create the Arctic Practice Group within that firm where he provides legal counsel to companies working in newly accessible regions of the nude north. So Ben, welcome. Our second guest is Ron Sandler. Ron is chair of the philosophy department, the F Department of Philosophy and Religion, and the director of the Ethics Institute at Northeastern University in Boston. Dr. Sandler is the author of several books, including environmental ethics, and is an internationally known figure in this area. So Ron, thank you for coming up from Boston to join us. And finally, we have my friend, our very own Barry Costa Pierce. Barry is a professor of marine sciences and is the director of UNE North, the Institute for North Atlantic Studies. So thank you, Barry, for moderating this discussion. 
So in just a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Barry to take over. But I would like to thank all of our guests. And I have a little something. And in case they don't let me back up here, I'm going to do this now. And I have a little something for each of you guys. I hope there's food. No, <laughs> no food in there. And this is, so this is a, um, a crystal lighthouse. And the lighthouse is um, uh, to reflect both the sort of light being a beacon of knowledge and truth, which is what we're all about, and also, of course, Maine. It's a Maine thing, lighthouses, right? <laughs> so just a little token of appreciation and something that we hope will help you remember this evening. So with that, take it away. Okay, good evening everyone. Auspicious day, eh? Uh, I don't know many of you have heard the Greta Thornburg speech of today. And uh, uh, she certainly touched a, a vibe. Uh, she, the romanticism, the sort of beyond the facts, the urgency of, uh, that came out of her voice in her speech today, I mean, it touched many of us. And I think that's, that's the kind of emotion we're going to need to bring to this issue especially for the young people here, it's, it's your future, and we support you. So how the, the central issue that President Herbert has mentioned tonight is how can we reconcile the profit motive with climate change? Now, I'll be your facilitator tonight. I'm going to be the devil's advocate. I've got some questions. I could even be the devil himself with some of you. So uh, not necessarily that I'm going to, you know, sort of, give my views on this. I'm going to try to provoke you a bit. Seen that side of you, yeah. Barry. Yeah, I know you have. So I'm going to, first of all, turn it over to Ben, then to Ron, because with Ron, the, the word ethics comes out as a real key word in this, and altruism, and all of those wonderful things that could bring people together someday. Yeah. But with Ben, um, we're a capitalist society. So is China and Russia. They're Absolutely, if, they're not, if, if people in the U.S. or in Europe are not going to tackle the benefits of climate change, these are all capitalist societies. Why would we ever think that they wouldn't go for the profit motive? And so are you as a lawyer, are you going to make new laws so that to sort of prevent you know, us from taking advantage in a capitalist way? Well, I don't, I, I don't make the laws. I just tell you what they mean. <laughs> so I, I think... I, I think uh, President Herbert set up the issue really well. When, when we talk about the Arctic, a lot of people imagine this sort of area that is pristine and that is perfect and that is untouched by human hands and that is you know, this, this sort of mythical place. Um, but you, what you have to remember is while there are a lot of those areas in the Arctic, you have to remember that there's four million people that live there and that the Arctic is, is a place for, the Arctic has been industrialized, it is industrialized, and it will continue to be industrialized. The GDP of, of all of the Arctic regions, if you, if you measure all of the Arctic countries and their regions in the, in the, in the region, uh, is about $500 billion. So that's, that's an economy the size of Malaysia. So when we talk about is it ethical to profit from climate change? I think what we're saying is, is who will profit from climate change? Or who will industrialize the Arctic? Or, or to put it more brunt bluntly, um, who will exploit the Arctic? Not it's who will exploit the Arctic, it's who will continue to exploit the Arctic. And that's kind of how we, that, that's how I look at the question. Um, because the, the fact of the matter is the Arctic is full of economic activity. There's diamond mines, there's natural gas uh, facilities in Russia on the Sabeta Peninsula. There are uh, reindeer herders that actually, that's a, that's a pretty big part of their economy is to sell reindeer meat. Um, there is, uh, there's even some uh, oil drilling in the ocean. There's probably um, other types of activities that I'm not even mentioning. So the question is, is, is who's up there right now and who's doing this work? And what we know is that we know that the Russians are, of course, very active. It's their country. And we know that the Chinese are there. We, um, we know that, um, you know, we, it's, we were all joking that, you know, Donald Trump wanted to buy, buy Greenland, but the reality is the Chinese have been on the ground in Greenland for a decade. They own a lot of the mineral rights there. So we can't buy Greenland. The Chinese already own it. 
Um, and so they are taking over. They have, they've shown a lot of interest in that area. And also, you know, the, another critical group that's, that's currently doing business in the Arctic is the Inuit people, the people that are from there. Um, one of the great success stories of, of, uh, of in the United States is setting up the um, indigenous corporations, corporations that are owned by the indigenous people in Alaska. If you're born into a tribe in Alaska, you're given shares, essentially, in a, a corporation that owns the mineral rights and the surface rights to the land that you were born in. And so when we talk about profiting from climate change, we're also talking about the benefits of the economic activity going to the people who are the indigenous people. Okay, Ron, why would we ever believe that we can sort of distill this down to altruism and ethics? Is, do we have any uh, past examples of how the world has come together in, in, to avert a massive crisis that are ethical? Um, the capitalist drive here is, is, is insanely powerful. So give me something, some hope that we altruistically and ethically can pull together to do something real in the Arctic. What, help us if from an ethics perspective distill this out. <laughs> I think it's two against one. <laughs> All right, so let me, uh, uh, let's back up. Um, if we're going to start the discussion and first we're going to say, oh, that's bad. Maybe let's start by actually thinking about the bad part here. So the baseline is that, is that global climate change is not bad. It's horrible. <laughs> and it's horrible along just about every dimension. And this will be, I will come to the altruistic bit at the end because that's your term, I, I, but we'll come to that. Uh, it's bad along every, just about every dimension. So if you care about biological diversity, right? On the business as usual trajectories, the expectation is that about somewhere around 15% of species are likely to go extinct. That is enormous. Right? The background historical rate of extinction is one species per million per year. There's about 10 to 15 million species, so in a regular, according to that historical trajectory, you have about 10 or 15 species go extinct a year. Already, without even talking about climate change, we're at hundreds or thousands a year just from habitat loss, extraction, other kinds of industrial activities, invasive species, and so on. Climate change is expected to put that orders of magnitude higher. Right? This is ecologically horrific. Right? Now imagine that you don't care about species. <laughs> Maybe not that hard for some people, <laughs> but imagine that you don't. Uh, imagine you care about peace, people. Right? Imagine you care about people. Well, estimates are that on the business as usual trajectory, there could be 100 million people who are displaced because of changes associated with climate change. Right? That's a, the climate refugees. Right? This is extraordinarily bad from a rights and human well-being perspective. And it's not just that bad for them. When you put 100 million people on the, on the move because they can't make a living, they can't grow food, they can't do other sorts of things, it is socially disruptive. Not so, socially and politically unbelievable, right? I mean, a few years ago we were watching refugees from the Syrian uh, civil war, right? The number of refugees that came out of the Syrian civil war that actually left Syria was 5 million. Five million people. Now you think orders of magnitude above that on the move, massive social disruption. Climate change is very bad, right? It's also extremely unjust because the people who are most responsible for causing climate change are those who have high emissions lifestyles, affluent people, and the people who are most exposed to the harms are people who don't have adaptive capacity or live really close to the land, right? So the people who are most causing it are the least exposed, right? And it's unjust intergenerationally because we are living large, right? We are consuming all these resources using these fossil fuels and who's gonna pay for that? It's future, it's the future is the answer. <laughs> all right, the future is the answer. So it, you don't have to care about species and you don't have to be altruistic. You have to, you know, it's kept to care about your family, you care about your, your community, you care about your country, you care about food. This is, uh, this, is, this is an extremely bad thing. So I'll start with that as my baseline. Okay, 
So now, are there ever cases where you have, now look, and it's a wicked hard problem. Is that a main, is wicked a word here? Okay, I'm from Massachusetts, it's a thing. It's a, okay, it's wicked hot here. All right, it's a wicked hot problem here uh, because it's a, it's a longitudinal collective action problem. It takes a lot of people doing a lot of things to get together to address this problem, very hard types of problems. So the question is, have there ever been cases where this has worked out? And the answer is yes, in Maine, in the lobster fisheries, right? It's a, it's a longitudinal collective commons problem that has been sorted out for generations. And in, and people have, in that context, traded short-term economic benefits for long-term sustainability. So you are the existence proof of this is possible. This has also happened with the ozone layer, right? The Montreal Protocols were able to put into a collective action process that reduced the amount of ozone-depleting emissions. Uh, so I should stop. But that, uh, so there's a couple examples of actual cases where it can be done. The baseline is that it's really, really hard. And so when we think about the profit motives uh, in these contexts, we have to think about what, that, what, that, what that's against, right? It's very easy to work on what it's for, but what's it, what's it against? Okay. Let's ask the lawyer before we turn it over to the crowd. So the Antarctic Treaty, the Oz of Montreal Protocols, uh, the Central Arctic now is banned as a moratorium on fishing in the Central Arctic. Only because, only because we don't know what fish are there. Okay, so only because we don't know that. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that... Charles is going to find that out. I'm just, Science I'm just saying that, that if out. there was cod there, then we'd be having a different conversation. Yeah, probably. So is it all about legal frameworks? Is there, are we going to work through UN conventions? Or or are we going to go and find a way, the Extinction Rebellion among this, the young people, the Greta Thunbergs, they're going to just get governments, they'll, they'll, they'll strangle governments by their power of their, of their emotional arguments to do something. Because right now, as President Herbert said, we're not doing anything. We're disincentivizing. Those that are taking advantage of climate change are disincentivizing to do something, okay? Because they've got short-term profits in mind. So is it going to be laws, Ben? What are we, international conventions? Or is it going to be ethics and romanticism that will take us there? No, I, I mean, I, I, there's, there, are, there are pieces of, each one of those is pieces of it. It's not all going to be international conventions, uh, at least. I, I, and, and again, I'm saying that, I'm not saying it should be international conventions. We should all agree on this. And no, I mean, nobody on this stage is going gonna, is gonna to dispute with anything that, that you said, Ron. This is a terrible, this is a terrible thing. And it's going to impact people um, a lot worse who aren't watching this right now. So, but the good news is that a lot of people in this room are future leaders, and a lot of people in this room can lead the charge. Uh, and, and, and that duty does not, we're not exempt from that. Old guys like you and me, you know, we still have to do this work. Uh, but it's not all going to be laws. A lot of it's going to be consumers. A lot of it is going to be, um, you know, the 401k and the investment funds that you choose to, to put your money in. Are they, are they doing the right thing? Are these companies doing the right thing? Are they compliant with uh, some of the protocols that are out there? There's a couple of uh, great uh, protocols that are being run by industry right now. The Polar Code is one of them. The Polar Code is a, is a set of laws, a set of regulations that the industry, the shipping industry, basically instit instituted on themselves that said, if we're going to put ships in the Arctic, they're going to meet these specifications. They're going to have to have this kind of safety gear. They're going to have to have these kind of qualifications for their personnel. Oh, and by the way, they're going to have to have these emission standards. You can't take ballast water, for example. You can't take on ballast water in the Philippines and then go through and empty your ballast water in Kirkenes. That's just not going to work because you're going to, you're going to introduce all, these, um, all of these invasive species. So that's an example of, a, of a, a regulation that the industries themselves have, have instituted. And um, there's other ones as well. There's, a, there's a, um, a protocol called the Arctic Investment Protocol, which was developed in part with the economic, um, Arctic Economic Council and Guggenheim Investments. You know, Guggenheim's talking about a trillion dollars that are, gonna needed, that are going to be needed in investment infrastructure in the Arctic. And so how are we going to do this? Well, are we going to hire the right contractors? Are they going to follow the right environmental standards? Are they going to hire indigenous people? Are they going to just come into a, come into a, a harbor and build a, 
build a, a wharf and, and not hire anybody and, and then leave. Um, and so a lot of that is, a lot of the solutions that you're talking about, Barry, are solutions that are driven not by uh, governments and not even by the UN, but they're actually driven by industry themselves. And I have to believe that a lot of that is because of the consumers. The consumers are gonna say, we don't wanna have anything to do with your company if they don't have, if they're not following these protocols. So Ron, the companies and businesses, they're gonna get ethics in spades. They're gonna, chief sustainability officers in these businesses, they're going to convince their CEOs to make less profit and because they're gonna be doing, doing the right thing ethically. Is that, is that what you, you see? What's the emerging ethics that are gonna bring us together and, and, and sort of then tackle the profit motive head on? Okay, so uh, let's talk about ethics, <laughs> because we are. Um, the idea of, of the eth so here's a, here's, a, here's a way of thinking about ethics. One way of thinking about ethics is um, that we all just out of the generous goodness of our heart decide to get along and do these, you know, the right thing or something like that. Here's another uh, conception of ethics. A conception of ethics, w uh, here's another way to think about ethics. What ethics does and ethical reflection does, and, and not just academic ethics, but ethics in all kinds of other domains, religious domains, all kinds of things, right? What ethics is about is envisioning, envisioning a world that's better than the world you're currently in, okay? If you think of science, the natural sciences, the hard sciences, as describing the way the world is and maybe coming up with some explanations for how the world came to be that way, and then there's some predictive sciences that aim to predict what's gonna happen. Um, ethics is, is the way of thinking about what would, what, what would it look like if the world was better than it is now, okay? So when we face climate change, we're looking at a world that's worse. And in a certain sense, the ethics here is a, it is a little bit sad because the ethics isn't how do we get better from here. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting over cold. It's um, how do we get to a less worse place than we are currently aiming for, okay? But that's a separate question from what are the mechanisms that we need to put into place to get us to the place that we think we should be aiming for, okay? So when we talk about ethics, I don't think ethics is gonna be the motive that gets everybody there. It's gonna take regulations and it's gonna take these sorts of things. It's gonna, and, and to the answer to the question, is it okay to make a profit from climate change? Yeah! By preventing climate change, <laughs> right? There's a huge amount of profit to be made by alternative energies, alternative infrastructures, working on ways of reducing emissions and earning credits or, or, or installing. I mean, there's, there are so many different ways of contributing to adaptation and happy, having cities and agricultural systems be able to adapt to the challenges that are, there are so many ways to profit from climate change. There's so many jobs to be had. There's so much wealth to be created by doing the massive work that's necessary to reduce the scale climate change, right? So the question I don't think is so much, is it okay to profit? It's, it's in what ways is it okay to profit? And, and I think that that is, um, that is a harder question. Uh, and, and I think there's some important distinctions to be made there. Yeah, Ron, thanks. That brings us to a really good place. Let's open it up now. Um, we'll take statements if you want to get up and make a statement, or we'll take questions. Don't be shy. We've got your futures at stake. Yes. You need a phone over there, a microphone. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess like my question is kind of for everybody, obviously, but um, in ethics, a lot of the times you have to draw a line somewhere. And I guess my question is, since you're three different diverse people, and what you do is where exactly do you think we should draw the line? Like, should we draw the line at using what climate change is changing, like the um, boat routes and allowing people to do that? Should we draw the line at not allowing them to use any of the changes that is caused by climate change? Should we only let them do it if it's sustainable or stuff like that? Or like, like where do you think that line should be drawn? Uh, uh, that excellent question. And that's something that we spend a lot of time on is where are the lines? Um, and I think from a, uh, uh, from the sort of basic point is the lines are sustainability and what's sustainability and that is where the costs of the of the activity uh, are the true costs of the activity so um, for example uh, in shipping 
uh, you know, when, when we ship uh, a product, uh, this glass from, from China, um, it's not the, the shipping costs aren't the real costs that are into shipping this glass because it doesn't take account the carbon. It doesn't take account the black soot that comes from the bunker fuel. So when, we, when we're talking about drawing the lines for, uh, on an industrial scale, when the industry gets together, they try to figure that out. So one example is um, uh, when we're talking about the shipping routes, there's a proposal on the table right now that would ban the burning of bunker fuel in the Arctic. And you can imagine a ship going through the Arctic. And if anybody that's seen the cruise ships in Portland know exactly what I'm talking about. When you see when they leave, a big plume of black smoke, that's all carbon and soot and sulfur and all kinds of stuff. Um, it's one thing for that stuff to get in the air. It's a whole other thing for that stuff to fall on the ice. Because now you're taking white ice and making it black, which makes the problem even worse. So when we talk about drawing the lines, that's what we try to do. Is we, we try to consider things. We try to consider the full, the full cost both the economic cost, the environmental cost, and also the, so the social cost. What, are the, what effect is this activity having on the indigenous people? That's where we draw the line. Man, you're asking all the hard questions. <laughs> Good. I, I think that's a, that, that is an excellent question because there were a lot of indigenous people that will say, we want to drill in the Arctic. That's our oil. And who are you, white person, to say, I can't drill my own oil on my own land. Look at all the oil you're drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. How is that fair? And I, I don't have an answer to that. Yeah. Ron. I like this question. <laughs> First of all, but, but we aren't that diverse. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, so uh, this is a hard question. It's a hard question, and I think the question is, and I just want to reformulate a bit, it's not necessarily line drawing, it's what criteria do you use, okay, to evaluate different proposals for economic activity of various kinds. So, so, um, so here's, um, here's some different possibilities, right? So one view might be, look, um, it's okay as long as you're not intentionally trying to further climate change, right? Here's another view. It's okay as long as your business model doesn't require that climate change occurs. Because even if you're not intentionally wanting to do it, but your business model requires that it happen, then you are complicit. Right? And you have an incentive to trying to make it happen. Right? Here's another possible one. Um, it's OK as long as it neither, you get the idea, it neither contributes nor depends on it happening. Here's another one. Uh, it's OK as long as what you're doing also decreases the scale of climate change in the future. So there's a lot of different um, ways to do it. And I think it's pretty obvious that it's not OK to actively try to contribute Right? And it's definitely OK, like I was mentioning before, to do things which mitigate or uh, are necessary for adaptation. The middle cases are, are a little bit harder. Um, you know, I, I, I'm begin I, I, I've been thinking about this because I knew I was going to be here. And I, 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 wonder, I, I wonder about the complicity cases a lot. Right? So you have an activity, uh, an economic activity that is made possible only if climate change continues to occur. Okay? And uh, I think that those are, those are the kind of morally problematic cases that we're going to see. Those are going to be the ones where like, oh, well, if we don't do it, these other people are going to do it. Right? Um, but those, those are the ones that are especially morally troubling when you think about complicity in other kinds of contexts. I got, okay, and I got one, uh, okay, I'll leave it there. I got, I got more, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, the geo, we can't separate the geopolitical from this. Uh, we go to the, UNI goes to the Arctic Circle Assembly every year. Most people stand up there and pontificate from a great height about sustainability in the sustainable Arctic, and then Russia stands up and say we're developing all of, 50% of the Arctic is owned by Russia, and uh, there's 
going for oil and gas all over that as area. fast as they can yeah, as fast yeah. as they can yeah. and so uh we geopolitically the united states supposedly an exceptional country it calls itself an exceptional country still has not signed the law of the sea convention which allows us not to have any dialogue with the other countries in the arctic so we you know we're really constrained geopolitically in a lot of ways and we got really push that agenda all the time, that we need to be involved with the United Nations, not pull out of UNESCO, not pull out of these United Nations organizations that are going to have these great discussions about how to go forward from the many different sides. Okay, open it up again. Ron, yeah, you want to say well, something? Well, I was just going to say, uh, I, I mean, you know, some, so now I think it's two against one my way, but the, but the <laughs> uh, you know, the idea of pricing in the true cost of a product. Right? You price in the carbon, you price in the emissions, yeah. you price in the ecological, you price in the human health, you price, price in the, the impacts on, uh, give a, a fair label, labor. I mean, you, you price all that in, right? it becomes a whole different economic situation. Yeah, right? absolutely. And I think that's the only way that you can, I think that, I'm not the ethicist, but I think that that's an ethical approach to doing it. it, it what, what, what I did, where, where, where I disagree with you on a little bit, Ron, is, is to say that, um, you can't have a business model that's dependent on uh, climate change happening. Because I think the adaptation strategies that you mentioned in an earlier remark depend on climate change happening. So, so if you're going to have an, if you're a company that say, um, let's say you're a company that, uh, um, you know, uh, makes a, a, a propulsion system in a ship, that switches over from bunker to natural gas when you're in the Arctic, and that's only that only is required. And you know, if if climate change continues to happen, you're still going to want to. It seems to me that that's an ethical business. If I could interrupt for just a second in the back here, our Facebook crowd, which is watching, has asked that questioners and commenters please wait to be recognized and have a microphone in your hand because they they can't hear the questions and therefore don't understand what the uh, forum panelists are responding to. Um, okay, here's the hard question for you, um, which is connected to this. Okay, here's the hard question. This is the hard question. You ready? Here it comes. The hard question is whether or not you can adequately address global climate change by making incremental improvements to our current economic political systems, right? Is it enough to price in carbon, right? Is it enough to do these sorts of things and continue with the same kind of global industrial, you know, basically approach to um, economic development, uh, the basic, same basic idea of a consumer-driven society? Like, can, can we keep all of the elements of the current system but, like, clean them up? Is that enough? Or does it require massive structural change? Not just massive infrastructure change, but massive rethinking some of these economic assumptions about what's okay and what's not okay and the type of system we want and the way in which we want to be as a society and so on and so forth, right? I, I don't know the answer to that question, right? But that's what a lot, I think, of the really hard debates are about because the question, it's similar, let me give you an, an analog that might resonate or might not. Um, food systems. You all know about the, lo the oh, I said y'all. Uh, the, you know, wicked, uh, all right, get back, okay. Uh, the, 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 lo the global versus local food system debates, right? So one, co one concern about sustainability in food systems, about carbon impacts on food systems, about animal welfare, about social disorder, all, that, all these sorts of things, right? is that the problem is that the true costs associated with food are not priced into the food. And if you had fair labor you know, practices and if you priced in the carbon, you did all these other sorts of things, then you have a fine system, right? But there's an alternative view out there which is called the alternative food systems view, which is that you actually need to build alternative food system structures, local food system structures, right? That are not global network, monoculture, industrial commodity, agricultural based, right? And that that's the right way to go forward. So I think the question for climate change is kind of like that question, but at a massive scale. And so thinking about, um, thinking about whether, or not it's, whether or not it's enough to price in the costs, whether or not it's okay to continue with, so look, somebody might say this, 
We have a massive problem here. Do you know where this problem came from? Not out of nowhere, from global industrial extraction, manufacturing commodity system. And so now what you're telling me is that the Arctic's opening up and you want to expand the system into there? Right? If you think that it's the systematic problem, then that's not going to be an acceptable, even if you do it in the right way. The alternative right, is that you, have, you look for other types of systems. That's the more radical alternative. Yes. Holly. So picking up on what you just said, Ron, and, and something actually that Ben said earlier, um, we talked about, uh, you mentioned, Ben, Russia owning their part of the Arctic. And I think that brings up a, a radical systems point of view, which is who owns what? And what does ownership mean in the face of climate change? So that's backing the bus up quite a ways, but this idea of can't, climate change defies all geopolitical boundaries. It defies economic boundaries, uh, defies social boundaries in terms of its impact. It's, it's agnostic. It just goes where it wants to go. So how do we redefine this idea of ownership? I think Greta Thornburg today challenged the people in the room to own it, you know, own the question of climate change um, and the challenges it presents. So I'm, I'm curious about where this word ownership plays into our thinking about climate change. I have, I have one point of view, which is, um, uh, people that own mineral rights, people that own, say, oil, they say they own the oil in the ground, um, and they have the right to pump the oil in the ground and sell it. They also have the right to be paid to keep it in the ground um, and to not pump it and to not sell it. One of the interesting proposals I, I saw recently was they were talking about the Amazon burning, and somebody said, well, why don't we just buy the Amazon? Why don't we just buy it? And then, and then we can stop it from burning. Like there's plenty of money out there. Um, you know, there's the Amazon could buy the Amazon. How would that work? That'd be pretty cool. But the idea of ownership, I think, is 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 interesting. I think it comes down to ownership and control, and control to use the resource or to not reuse the resource and preserve the resource. Well, I think this is. I mean, this is a good illustration of the type of question that goes back to the, the whether you need systematic change or whether you need incremental change, right? Because you can come up with all these market-based solutions, right? You pay people so that they don't cut down the forest and take the oil out of the ground, and you price in carbon, and you do you, that. You look for these market. I mean, you start a you know a, you start up a company that um, identifies greenhouse gases and blows them up with a laser, so you earn clean carbon clean carbon credits that you can sell on the California trade, you know, the clean, like there's, there's, there's market-based solutions. My friend has that company, by the way. Um, uh, so there's market-based solutions, or is it the idea of ownership something that needs to be, like, what, what is this, how could it even be that people could have the rights to do something like this, right? So ownership doesn't generally mean the, the absolute control over what you own. It's a bundle of rights to do something with respect to something. It's always constrained by other sorts of things. You, I can't, there's, there's things that I can't do with my property, where I, my house, right? It's constrained by obligations I have to my neighbors, right? I don't have absolute right to do anything I want. Right? Maybe it turns out that one of the things that you can't do with the rights that you have to your land and your property is do things on them that cause massive, that contributes to massive harms to other people. Right? Maybe, I mean, that's a, maybe that's a possibility. And then you have a way of, you have to have a liability system to be able to hold people accountable. But I think that's another way to think about it, right? So you can have, you have market-based solutions, that's one thing. Rethinking the nature of property and ownership and what those bundles of rights actually are is another type of thing. Okay, more from the audience. Somebody under 30, please. Remember, we used to say that don't trust anybody over 30 years old. We used to, my generation said that, actually. Yes, over here. Somebody in the back. Hi. Um, so I'm Priyal. I just wanted to ask a few questions. So you've illustrated that um, in order for us to really do something, you've said that we are the consumer themselves. We can just change the niche in the society that we have. The real issue is that who cares about these CEOs? Who cares? They mean nothing to us. Our objective is to change the niche in the environment that these CEOs have in order to allow them to further uh, you know, innovate into the perspectives we want. 
And that's where I feel like I had a question for the ethics. Does ethics really matter? It's meaningless in this area. It, your objective, in my viewpoint, it really doesn't have any viewpoint here more than it just exists. And no CEO is ever going to follow that ethics without some viewpoint backing it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So again, I mean, uh, the, the point, th so, uh, my, the idea here isn't that CEOs are going to have an ethical epiphany and then they're just going to do these things, right? The idea is that if we think that the right thing to do is to try to do these things, you need political action to get done to change the, sh the, to change the decision structure that the CEOs are facing, right? This is our, so let's just give you an example of where we already see something like this happening a little bit. Uh, so another area where I, I do some work is I do some work in AI and data ethics, right? And it's already becoming clear to CEOs of companies that if they merely comply with privacy laws, that's not going to be good enough because consumers and their employees are going to complain and they're going to leave them, right? And so there's actually consumer demand. There's actually demand on the part of the companies driven by consumer demand that outstrips regulatory requirements to actually build in certain kinds of privacy and other kinds of controls into the system. So the idea isn't that the CEOs are just going to be, are, they're just going to be suddenly happy to do it. The idea is that enough people, either acting as consumers or political citizens, those aren't the same thing, could change the environment in which the CEOs are making those decisions that they have to, that they're going to make. Now, look, we're not going to change what Russia is going to do. Yeah. Well, let me Sorry. just let I, me just finish this last thought. Yeah. Go they're going to change what they're going to do, but just because they do something bad doesn't mean that that's the vision that we set for ourselves. Um, sorry, I meant. Sorry, I'm a little flustered. There's too many people watching. My point is, um, what's going to force these other people to cause the strain on the CEOs? They're the ethics that we're kind of focusing on. You want these people to go and demand, right, that that's we what, do something. That's what they're what's doing. What's forcing them? That's what people are trying and starting to do. That, that's what's happening. That this, look, the social change. Uh, here's a thing, here's a fact about the Constitution. There is no Clean Water Act in the Constitution. There is no Clean Air Act in the Constitution. The EPA is not a, an original government thing. What happened was that in the 50s and 60s, People got so fed up with dirty water, with, with acid rain, with, with pollution in the air, healthy, that, that people started to mobilize first at the local level, then at the state level, and then at the federal level. And then in the early 70s, a Democratic Congress passed these laws and a Republican president signed them. So I think, I, I think that the, the, the pressure is not only political, because of course when you talk about politics and, and agency, you also talk about capture, and you talk about industries that can capture these agencies and capture the political power. And I think w an, the most important area that we're going to see, in, from my view, is consumerism. It's con the consumer demanding that these things be done. I was, just came from a discussion with a bunch of uh, with a bunch of farmers, and one of the things they were telling me about was was you know, they have all these regulations that they have to meet. They they have the local regulations that they have to meet. They have federal regulations that they have to meet, and then they have their regulations that go into whether or not they can be considered an organic farm. And they're happy to meet all of those regulations. That's what they want because they know that once that once they have that organic symbol on their product, that there is there is going to be a market for their product, and they can charge a premium for it, and there'll be a certain level of demand for it. And of course, we're always worried about capturing those labels as well, right? So what happens when you know when Kellogg's wants to get in the business of organic things, and how valid is that label? But set, setting that aside for a moment. The, the consumers uh, are, are sending the message back up the supply chain into these companies and the CEOs are starting to respond to, to it. And so I think it takes both things. I think it takes uh, you all voting the right way for the right candidates that you think will do the best job for you, but also you deciding what products you're going to use, how much of the products you're going to use, and eventually deciding where is the money going that you're investing in. When you start saving for your retirement, you start saving for you know, for, for various things. How is that money being spent? Where is that money being invested? And what values do those companies have that are investing in it? 
Okay, so is there a new ethic arising beyond just financial profit? I mean, one example would be is uh, now Col Columbus Day is turned to Indigenous Peoples Day. I mean, we're, signing, we're, we're, we're coming up with new ways of realizing our past and maybe like thinking about the future of, the very future of business and capitalism, more human-centered, more, more rational based upon some of the mistakes of the past. Is, is that, do, do people feel that we're in, a, in, a, in a, a wave of change? What do you feel in the audience? Or do you feel just so depressed about what we've said, you can't get beyond some of the, the dire parts of, of what has come at you tonight? Questions? We have a question right here. Yes? Alrighty. So. I'm um, just going to backtrack a little bit to a comment that was made at the beginning of the talk about the representation of the Arctic as being serene and sort of untouched. Um, that's a good note on my phone. Uh, the question goes out to both parties. So how does the misrepresentation of the Arctic as being serene and untouched affect large industries' decisions to go after resources? And sort of a follow-up yes or no, is the portrayal of the Arctic as such, is that, eth is that ethical? So your first question is, uh, I, 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 don't, um, I, can't, I don't presume to speak for a, a CEO making a decision about whether to invest in, say, um, a new diamond mine in, in the north of Canada. Um, but I think that the image of the Arctic being, um, being pristine would certainly affect, say, reputational concerns of a company that was, that was doing business up there. Um, I think companies in general are very concerned about how they uh, how they appear um, to 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 their consumers, uh, to their shareholders. They don't want to be seen as spoiling an untouched wilderness. Um, what was the second part of of, of the question again? Uh, yeah. So it was just basically, um, is it ethical to portray the Arctic as being like that? Yeah. That that that's in, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know if it's ethical or not. I, I know that um, a lot of people don't know that there is so much eco economic activity going on in the Arctic, and I think it's it's important to inform that discussion that we're that the economic economic activity is already there. It's just a question of how it's being done, who's doing it, and under what standards. That's a really interesting question. Uh, so it reminds me of a, a debate that was that happened. It's been going on for decades now, which is about the wilderness myth. If you have heard about this, but it was the idea that there is this notion of of natural areas as a kind of pristine wilderness separate from people, right? And then the criticism was that it's not actually like that, and portraying it that way was is actually problematic because it marginalizes the people who are in those places, which are mostly indigenous peoples, right? And it enables a way of thinking about those places that excludes them, right? So I think that it is potentially, it is potentially ethically problematic to misrepresent what's going on there if it's being done for ways that are going to be disadvantaging to the people in those places. So that, that seems, I mean, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that. But I guess the other thing I, would, I just would want to emphasize is that the, none of the arguments or, or none of the considerations that I sort of gave off the top for wanting for why we should really find this to be an urgent issue, intergenerational justice, social justice across peoples, loss of species, harms and human rights violations, none of these actually depends on conceiving of the Arctic or anywhere else as a pristine place, right? None of them were like, the world is pristine and we have to keep it that way. That would be... Um, One of the more alarming things that you're seeing in the Arctic right now is this sort of last chance tourism. It's being driven by massive tourist country companies also in, in Asia and other places. And you're seeing towns like in northern Norway, like Kirkenes, that are absolutely overrun with these uh, last chance tourists. You know, get, get the last polar bear on your, in, on your iPhone. I mean, so that, that is a trend that is occurring right now that many of you might have, have seen that is really, really alarming, and it's, it's causing massive change in, in travel patterns, et cetera. Something we have, in the a, we yes. have a question from a Facebook viewer, if I could interject. 
Um, the question is, do the panelists envision a label or a certification for Arctic-derived products that designates them as Arctic-friendly, so that consumers will be given a way of demanding responsible standards similar to the organic label that Ben mentioned? Um, okay, so I don't, I'm not, one doesn't pop into my head right now, but I'm sure they're out there. One, one area for, for people to follow, and we just don't see enough discussion about this here in the United States, is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, um, Greta Thunberg uh, uh, made a big splash when she sailed across the Atlantic into New York Harbor. I don't know if anybody noticed this or not, but the UN sent out 17 sailboats to meet her, and they all had different color sails, and all those sails were representative of the sust sustainable development goals. And so I, 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 would, I think that a, a label or a certification um, as an Arctic-friendly product might end up um, probably something derived from, from those goals. I once had a student, a group of students who did a research project where they tried to identify and categorize all of the environmentally related uh, food and product labels. At 327, <laughs> we stopped. <laughs> so my guess is that there's something like that. But you know, there's labels and there's labels. And you have to know who's doing them, what the standards are, how are the enforcement mechanisms, what's the oversight. There's a lot of different things that go into making an ethical label an ethical label. Other questions? Yes, over here. Hi. Um, I have a, a question, but it has a couple parts. Um, I was a student not that long ago, sitting in seats similar to this, and uh, I'm now uh, out using my skills in the environmental world as a water quality consultant and probably one of the biggest environmental nutcases you could come across uh, just in terms of priorities in life. Um, but I seem to be missing something here because I walked in hoping that I would hear a little bit more background but also initiative and I guess the background is the socioeconomic and disparity that we and the education that is lacking in this country in order to actually make the change that you are talking about uh, ethically, I don't think it's possible. And we are out of time at this point to actually make a major shift in any sort of capitalism trajectory in this country. We have no time left. I think pretty much everybody would agree with me on that if you, uh, if you know basically what's going on in general. Um, I guess I would just, I, I, there are two things, but I just want that to come to the front of this discussion that it basically, ethically, if you have the opportunity right now to start planning to do something well for a sustainable future, um, whether it is in the Arctic or elsewhere, do it because we don't have time. So we have run into these horrible occasions in this country where we hit the, you know, it's, it's a horrible situation, many, many cases where we just have to act very fast and they're never sustainable solutions. So we have, uh, we have an opportunity right now to plan knowing that we are not going to change the system in the time that we have left. So why wouldn't we take that opportunity and ethically, why wouldn't we take that opportunity to start planning for the future and do it in a way that's responsible? Thank you. You know, it's interesting. I, uh, a lot of people would take that as a very radical statement, but you know, radical is roots, and you're getting to the roots of the, of the issue, so thank you. Uh, one comment is that traveling internationally, I just came back from Norway and Sweden, you're starting to see uh, governments, the government of Finland is reordering, reordering all of its ministries uh, along the sustainable development goals. It's really hopeful, and in, in institutes in Finland, for example, are becoming, rather than in, uh, but departments of biology, chemistry, and physics, they're becoming departments of food, energy, water, waste, and shelter. And so there, are, there is hope out there. Um, I would hope someday that we could learn a lot more from some of these places. You don't sound like a nut job <laughs> at all. So, uh, but, two, but two, I, I do want to push back into one thing. So I think there's, 
there's, there's a danger to saying, oh, we've got time. Because we don't have time because climate change is already happening. Coast levels are, sea level rises are inundating coastal communities. The storms are getting worse. The Great Barrier Reef is in trouble. Like, there's a lot of bad stuff going on. Fair enough, same, right? M melt, right? Changes in species, latitudes, right? There all, all sorts of stuff. Um, but there's also a uh, danger to saying it's too late, right? Th th that we're running out of time, right? Th this, is, this is a longitudinal problem. So there's, uh, it's always better to do something <laughs> because the back, bad effects are backloaded, right? The, the, the worst stuff is in the future. And so the more that we can do now to decrease the bad stuffs in the future, whether it's doing it now, five years now, it's always better to continue to, to do more, right? So I would just, I, I, you know, absolutely have to do these things, but also we don't want to say, think of it in terms of a timeline which we're not going to meet, right? It's, 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 it's a on, the, the systematic change, if it's required, is an ongoing process, right? It's an ongoing process of changing energy infrastructures, transportation infrastructures, right? All kinds of things. And those are many, many decades of projects. There are things that we can do right now. There are things that we can do in the Arctic right now to build the infrastructure. As Barry said, there, there's these uh, uh, last chance tourism movements that are just causing throngs and throngs of people to go up into the Arctic, which puts a ton of demand on the natural resources and the infrastructure in there. There's, there's tourism that's happening where there is no infrastructure. The Crystal Serenity is a cruise ship that started in Anchorage and it sailed all the way around the, the, the Northwest Passage, came all the way down between Greenland and Canada. The Crystal Serenity is a ship that was built for the sailing in the Caribbean. It was built to serve daiquiris as you're going from Abaco to all these other places in the Caribbean. It was not built for the Arctic. They're building ships to do cruising in the Arctic to tap this market, but there's no infrastructure up there for them. So what happens when you get 2,000 people in the Northwest Passage? You remember, remember the Costa Concordia? That ship ran aground, it hit, it hit some rocks, it sank off the coast of Italy. Perfect conditions, perfect night. The first rescue boat was on station in about 90 minutes. You couldn't have asked for better circumstances and still 32 people died. Imagine what happens when one of those ships runs aground in Northwest Passage, where the first rescue vessel is maybe five days away, where the first helicopter that can get there maybe can only be on station for 20 minutes before it has to go back for fuel. So the, the point that you make is an excellent one, which is that there are things that we can do right now. now I'm talking mostly about adaptation strategies, um, but there's certainly mitigation strategies that we can do right now. Okay, more from the audience, please. The room. Hi. Okay, so I wanted to go back to, you had asked the question about whether all of us are hopeful or depressed. And something that I've been seeing a lot of is most of us believe that science and technology are going to be the things that theoretically save us or at least make it less awful. And something I've been seeing a lot of criticism about in the media, even by other scientists in the community, is that we can make all these technologies and all these sciences, but are they actually going to benefit us in the long term? Because no one actually knows if solar power or wind energy or using algae to collect carbon dioxide, if it's actually going to be something that is beneficial long term or if it's something that we're just kind of doing right now because we need it right now. And so I guess my question is, do you think that we should continue to wait to apply all of these methods internationally because we don't know the long-term effects? Or do you think that we should continue to kind of keep doing all these little things and kind of put Band-Aids on this big problem without being concerned about the long-term effects? Well, I mean, you have to, you have to, you have to look at each technology you have to run an assessment on each technology, right? All green energy technologies are not the same. Damming rivers, for example, has other ecological impacts that are quite bad. Uh, solar, you know, there's the mining processes and the refining processes and the production processes, so it has to be done in the right sort. I mean, there's a lot that goes into doing the complete technological assessments. Uh, but, you know, a lot of these things are absolutely necessary and they're ready to scale, and if you gave financial incentives to them, just like you do to the fossil fuel industry, you know, they, they would be competitive in various kinds of um, but I, I do want to take up the issue of can you do it with technology alone? And the answer is no, 
right? I mean, at the beginning, it was asked, have you ever, do you ever remember a time where people got together and solved an environmental problem? And I said, yes, and I listed a whole bunch. I can't remember a time where a technology that was, was created to solve a, by itself an environmental problem. What will happen sometimes is a law will get passed that will require using the technology, but the technology by itself never does it. Okay, it, has, you ha it, has to be in, it has to be a structure that makes it be. The other thing about climate change is when we talk about reducing emissions, and we're talking about hundreds of gigaton, hundreds of billions of tons of carbon emissions that have to be reduced by 2100, right, on, on the 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level trajectories. That's, that's from business as usual scenarios, right? The business as usual scenario kind of goes like this. But all that growth in the business as usual scenario, that's, that's our growth in consumption patterns and population growth. Right? So it's very unlikely that we'll be able to reduce emissions enough, reduce emissions enough just by decreasing the carbon footprint of the energy supply and increasing the efficiency of our economic activity so that it requires less energy. Right? Those are the kind of technical sides. It's also going to require addressing consumption patterns and population growth. Right? But there are ways to do that that are win-win-win ways. I mean, you can, you can address population growth by giving educational opportunities and healthcare to women in developing countries who don't currently have access to it, right? So there's ways to do these things which are, they should be done anyways, and look, they also can help with these things. But I don't think technology alone will be enough, it's ever been enough. I, I think you bring up a really interesting question, which is, uh, if we have a technology that does work, or that we think works, at what point do we sort of uh, make the decision on deployment without knowing fully what the ramifications are. I mean, you could think of a, the analogy would be like a medical treatment. You know, if we say, okay, we ha we have a drug, we don't yet know what all the side effects are, but it's we think it's so beneficial, we got to get it out out into market. What Ron, what what do you see as sort of a decisional model for for deploying technological changes like that that might affect climate change? I think, again, you have to look case by case. So there's some hard cases out there. So one of the hard cases is next generation nuclear power, right? And I know that this splits people in the climate community, right? I mean, in the United States, you know, it's still the case that over 60% of the energy production is from fossil fuel sources, right? Uh, the rest is from what, some, some form of renewable. But the biggest one of those, by a lot, 20%, is nuclear. Right? Solar energy is only a few percent of our, of our production. Right? And so there's a lot of companies that are working on next generation nuclear, smaller nuclear, so that it doesn't have you know, as, as some of the same problems as well. So there's, there's real hard questions to be asked about whether or not to try to, wh wh whether to scale these things, right? Whether to scale these things. And, and, and you know, communities are gonna have to be involved, there has to be robust assessments and all these sorts of things. But something like rooftop solar, like what, you know, there are some issues to do with the resource base because you do have to get the, the, the stuff to make it, right? And that right. does require some mining. So there are some ecological things. But my goodness, in, if you think about, you know, we talked earlier about is it okay to profit? It's okay to profit by doing things that would help mitigate, right? Rooftop solar, more than expanding shipping lanes, right, is going to create jobs in local communities right where you're putting on the rooftop solar, right? So, you know, sometimes I visit places that have more sun than where I live and probably where you live. Uh, and I'm like, how is it not the case that we're just not putting rooftop solar? Like th this seems to be a, you know, a, a much easier kind of question than should we put a nuclear power plant here, right? So but you gotta look at them, you know, I, there's no single one, but yeah. so, some have, uh, so, so uh, let me just, so, so here are the questions that I think you should ask. One is, is it implement, what's the timeline for it being implementable? Another question, is it scalable? Another question, does it add or displace? Another question, what are the ancillary benefits? Does creating this do something else that's good like create jobs? Another question, what are the potential downsides and risks associated with this? These can be quite, quite substantial with nuclear. So there's actually, a, a, I think there's a number of questions that you can ask about potential adaptation strategies and technologies that you might use that can illuminate their ethical profiles, right? Greta had on her jacket, believe in the science. I don't know if you saw that, I loved it. Okay, here. Um, so during this discussion, you have expanded on why climate change is horrendous. And I applaud you greatly for how you've conducted this conversation so far. But my question is, if corporations, CEOs, literally anyone in any kind of economic or political power were to stop and care about this 
this situation as much as everyone in this room does, is it irreversible? And we've talked about the problem, but we haven't talked about if everyone were to, or personally yourself, what would be the first step we could economically or ethically take? Um, we could sign the Law of the Sea Treaty. The United States could, could ratify that right now, which would give us uh, a seat at the table to have discussions that are meaningful and important and impactful. Could re-engage the Paris Agreement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, 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 uh, I got a little bit, I got a little, here's the thing about the Paris Agreement. So the structure of the Paris Agreement is such that actually what it requires of countries is basically nothing. All it requires is that countries submit their independently nationally determined commitments for how much they're going to reduce. It doesn't tell countries how much they have to reduce. The U.S. could actually be part of the Paris Agreement, just add up what all the states are doing on their own, submit that as their goal, and say, we did it. Right? And then it'll be a couple more years, and then we resubmit right, our goals. This is how it works. Iterative process to try to get to what's the necessary amount of reduction. It's not a hard cap. It's, it's a bottom-up approach. All right. And we have examples. Here's another example. I'm like a good one. Uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, right, which is, uh, con covers electricity production in the Northeast. Right? This has reduced emissions. It has ancillary benefits because the, the money that comes from selling the emissions credits goes to uh, um, efficiency programs. Right? So the, between the Northeast and California, we, we could... Uh, well, I, I, think, I, I think what I'm hearing you say, Ron, is... is one of the concepts that gets in the way of a lot of this is this notion of sovereignty. This notion that we in the United States, our country, we are a sovereign country, which means we report only to, to the man upstairs and we have no accountability to the rest of the country or to the rest of the countries or the rest of the world. And that's what's in the way of ratifying a lot of these international treaties. Um, which in Paris is not an international treaty and it has no, no legal effect, but the law of the sea is an international treaty and it has, it has profound legal effect. But so the, the, the idea that we, one of the things that we need to do here in this country is get around this idea of sovereignty, that somehow we are only accountable um, you know, to ourselves and not to the rest of the countries. You know, it's interesting at coming just out of the Arctic last week, this was discussed in intensely uh, that maybe corporations, multinational corporations, who are much more flexible, they can do things that governments sometimes can't, that they maybe could lead the way in the sustainability movement. And indeed, we heard uh, companies hiring chief sustainability officers, and they were asking me, are we training these, are academic institutions training young people to be chief sustainability officers someday from my company? More questions? Yeah, so um, I really appreciate the conversation that's gone on so far and uh, Ron's contribution in terms of thinking about these criteria that we might apply to think about some of these issues. And first of all, um, my work focuses on climate change adaptation, so that's where I'm coming from. And certainly from that perspective, we the definition of adaptation is both minimizing harm as well as taking advantage of opportunities. But thinking about how we take advantage of those opportunities is key. And I just want to start by um, pointing out the framing of transnational corporations taking advantage of these opportunities in the same playing field as, for example, Sami uh, reindeer herders in the Arctic um, is quite offensive. Um, so I just want to point that out because they are not operating on a level playing field and it erases the, the violence that has been done through colonization for centuries. So um, just starting out there. Um, in the adaptation world, we also talk about maladaptation, and there's been a lot of work done on that, but there's a seminal paper that points out at least five criteria that you could identify maladaptation by. Um, and I'll just point out two, and I'd like to hear from um, the panelists about you know, how that might play out in, in your various perspectives. But the first is that um, any adaptation that would increase greenhouse gas emissions would be considered maladaptation. The second is that um, any adaptation that would disproportionately affect 
those who are uh, the least advantaged or most vulnerable in our populations would also be considered maladaptation. So um, I'd just like to hear um, your thoughts on that and how we might apply that from your perspectives. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But I, but I think that, you point, that it raises another important point about adaptation and mitigation. So, and this was actually made earlier about climate change doesn't care where you are, right? So the thing that's, there's an asymmetry between emissions and mitigation and adaptation, and this is the asymmetry. The asymmetry is that when emissions go up and it changes the climate and it affects uh, ecological systems, those harms are, there's one, there's the, the beneficiaries are the people who emit, and then the harms are borne widely, right? In fact, they're most, suffered by people who are live closest to the land, who are you know, small-scale farmers or herders or fisher people or any of these, these sorts of things, right? Or have, have low levels of income, and so they don't have much social capital, they can't move these sorts of stuff, right? Adaptation is local, right? The emissions are global, but adaptation is local. So for example, when you build a seawall to protect South Florida, if that's a thing that's going to happen, or New York, or whatever, that doesn't help anybody anywhere else in the world except for there. Okay, so um, so this is why your point is so important, right? That you have to think not just about the mitigation effect, about about uh, mitigation and adaptation. You got to think about the distributions of the benefits and the harms of those two activities, right? And in general, mitigation is is better than trying to push it off and saying, oh, we'll use resources instead later on to adapt. Because the adaptation is gonna only be an option for those who already have the resources, who are those who are most responsible for causing the problem. Whereas it's not gonna be an option for the people who are least responsible for causing the problem and are most exposed to the harms. So I would say yes, and then I would say it's, it's even more than that, right? It's, it's making sure that there's necessary uh, sharing of technology and resource sharing as part of making up for the, the un injustices to make sure that people who don't have resources to adapt do have a, resources to adapt. I, I think um, the, uh, the framework that, that, that you mentioned in that, in that paper is, is really interesting to me because it's, it's, it's reflective in a lot of the discussions that happen on an international level. Um, as, you, um, as you know, the uh, indigenous people have a permanent seat uh, in a lot of these um, international dip, uh, diploma, diplomatic discussions that are going on, like the Arctic Council. They have, an, a, a, they, they have a permanent seat there. There's a saying that they, that they say, um, nothing about us without us. So you're not gonna make a decision of something, about something that happens in the Arctic unless we have a say in it. Uh, I respect that point of view, um, and uh, to uh, we try to, in my work, we try to um, engage with indigenous people and make sure that there's a voice in there with the indigenous people in, in, in almost anything that we do. Um, and and that's, a, that's an incredibly um, powerful um, um, cons uh, constituency. The indigenous people, uh, though, they, there is, um, uh, they are affected by climate change, uh, and and so when we talk about adaptation strategies, it's the way that I think of it is is how are we going to uh, help indigenous folks, indigenous people uh, adapt to their new environment, to this new environment that's been foisted upon them through through no fault of their own, uh, and that means um, you know wh how can we help them with uh, how can we help the Sami reindeer herders? Um, what can we do about the suicide rate among the indigenous people in Canada? which is skyrocketing. Um, what, uh, what are some of the solutions that we can come up with uh, here in our universities, at this university in, in, in Boston? Are there solutions that we can, can help to, help to um, mitigate the, some of these massive social problems? More from the audience, please. Over here. Um, I'm going to go back to when you said uh, the new ethics. Uh, no offense, but I kind of disagree with you. Um, I don't think it's new. I think that it's been happening, like when we had the Clean Air Act and stuff. I just think that less people are more encouraged and empowered to talk about this and take a stance, especially the younger generation. 
Um, and I think that it's important to feel empowered and how she had said back there um, to be like more educated and I just want to know your stance on that too because I know like like yeah like we should be educated on like climate change but like what ways of climate change should we be educated on should we be educated on the sustainable ethics should we be educated on the different types of CEO practices that people can take a part in and being educated or should we like tell people that like money talks I like her. <laughs> yeah, she she asked the hard question. Yeah. Actually, all the questions have been pretty difficult. Yeah. So, so the, the, no the, softballs in this room. Yeah. So I 100% agree with you about this. This is not a new ethic. Caring about future generations is not a new ethic, right? Social justice is not a new ethic. Environmental ethics is kind of a new ethic. I mean, it's you know 30, 40 years old, right? But 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 we're not reinventing anything here. These are these are human rights. Like not, you don't. The, the basic ethical framework is to make sense of why this is bad and what we need to do about it and to evaluate possible adaptation strategies and the other sorts of things are not, yeah. Hold, hold on, wait for a microphone. Yeah. So like, I'm plant crazy, um, and I know that you keep, like people keep mentioning like the future generation and stuff, but like, can we also include like our future environment and like our future species too? Because so I, that's why I said environmental ethics, right? Yeah. So, so the, the idea that, that indiv that's not uh, my, but that's not as old. That's only 60s, 70s, right? Thinking about each individual species as mattering or ecological systems as having value in and of themselves. I mean, for, it's the 40s, 50s. So that's not as, old, but that's still not new, right? Like that's older than me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so, so that's right. So, um, so that's one thing. The other, the other question you had about was edu was education. And it's weird the ways in which, well, it's like the ways in, is it education? So, well, let's talk, we can talk about climate denial, right? And, and, and it's kind of, it's really interesting the way that that has played out. So initially it was like, oh, the climate's not changing. But then everybody was like, come on, right? And they're like, oh, no, 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 it's changing. It's just not human cost. Right? And everybody's like, well, wait a second, greenhouse effect, we know how the mechanism works and we can measure the carbon dioxide coming out, like this is not a thing. And they're like, they're like oh, okay, well, it's not gonna be so bad, right? And, but now, we're starting to see the effects on the barrier reef and displaced peoples and all that, it's like, it's, it's bad, right? And then they're like, oh, uh, uh, there's nothing we can do about it. Or, oh, the technology will solve the problem, right? So I think actually, we've actually moved through some stages of denial here. Um, and that the type of questions that people are asking about, like, like what are the actual policies that we could put in place that can do? What, what can actually be done to solve this? Is, which technology should we use? How do we evaluate which technology? Like, that, those are like, that, that's where we need to be, right? So I actually feel like, uh, like, like there's progress here. I, I want to answer your education question. Um, y you're, you are not going to be able to learn everything that you need to know. So, here, so here's what you do. You, you study your area, and then you find collaborators in other fields. So if you're, studying, if you're studying agriculture, then you need to get with somebody that's studying social science and study somebody that's studying other areas of science, law, and policy. All of these people need to be in your group as you move through undergraduate studies and then as you move into graduate studies. Look, look for graduate programs that force you to work with other people from other disciplines. It's incredibly important. And then when you start working, work with companies that employ people from other disciplines so that you can all look at these problems from various aspects. You know, we, the, the age of sort of living in this sort of siloed professional practice is over. I call upon scientists constantly i call upon i call upon humanities all the time i have a book of i have like three books of poetry behind my desk 
you know so when i you know when i'm when i'm trying to think of a concept or something like that i might flip flip to a to a to a book of poetry that helps me sort of think about my legal reasoning and so that's really that's what i would recommend is that study your area and study it hard and well but then get with other people and it's helpful to get with other people who don't necessarily agree with you we knew you were always a poet there. Ben. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, before we take the next question, I want to make sure that we, we, we're getting back to the central reason why we're here tonight, which is how are we going to turn around the profit motive, or how can we use the profit motive in order to avoid the worst of what's coming in climate change? I'm turning the question around a little bit. So are there some solutions that we can think about tonight? Yes, next question. Uh, hello, um, my name is George, and this is my first year at UNE. So um, I'm really interested in this topic. Um, one of the solutions I've heard, I mean, I'm from New York City. I've seen a lot of strange stuff. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen an oyster population that once numbered in the millions reduced to minimal. I've seen a lot of weird stuff going down the coast of the country. I've even heard uh, some lawmakers propose solutions like the Green New Deal. Like if, I don't know if anyone knows that or not, but what I want to ask about your opinion and do you think if the Green New Deal was implemented, would it make any difference? Would it change anything? And I've even heard of some theories like having more babies would help fight climate change, uh, which is really weird. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's the question. What do you think? Good no, uh, no, on the, on the babies <laughs> no answer, babies. <laughs> right? Th I mean, look, the population trajectory that we're on, I mean, we're, we're look, think about it's so you think when you think about population what are we at now seven plus billion something like this right and when you think about it it's not just the sheer number it's the rate at which the population has been increasing so like it was a billion people a hundred years a uh, hundred years ago right the planet had to absorb six hundred percent increase along with technology and increased consumption patterns right so there's something really you know more more babies is not the end of the climate. The Green New Deal is really interesting, and actually I think it goes back to a question that I posed earlier in the discussion, which is at the core of the Green New Deal is this radical idea that this problem is, it cannot be addressed through incremental change of existing systems. Distant, existing production systems, existing energy systems, existing transportation systems, that it requires something more radical than that, right? Now, there's a lot of other stuff in there, and then there's all the politics around that, but I think focusing on that core question is an important question to focus on. And just, you know, there, th that, that idea that it requires that kind of structural change uh, didn't just come out of New York. <laughs> it did come out of New York. But it, but, but it came out of other radical places like the Vatican. So Pope Francis published uh, an encyclical, Laudato Si, on climate change. And if you read that and you read the Green New Deal, and you ask yourself, who's the bigger radical here? You will have a hard time figuring it out, right? That he, he connects the issue of climate change to poverty, to economic system, to human rights, to human welfare, to spiritual uplift. So, um, so it's not just New York. <laughs> I, I think that the name, the Green New Deal, is brilliant. It, it, it really caps, it encapsulates the scope and the scale of what it is that we're talking about. Um, you know, the new, but you have to remember, um, and if you haven't been exposed to this yet, you will, the New Deal was not very popular. It got a ton of resistance. They called it <gasps> socialism, <laughs> right? It got, there was massive, massive challenge to that, and it was not, it was not something that was easily passed. And so it took a lot of people suffering, and it took a lot of a lot of political will, a lot of a lot of people getting out there, a lot of young people getting out there and saying, "No, this is the future that we're demanding for ourselves." It also took a threat to pack the Supreme Court, which ironically is something that's on the table right now. So uh, we are we are in this generational change, and um, I'm just looking out at everybody here, and I'm just I'm, I I know it's daunting. I know the challenge that's been presented to you is is a tough one. Um, but uh, I'm hopeful. 
All right, with that, I'm going to um, uh, thank our panelists very much, the, all three of you. This was a really fantastic conversation. And so I think I learned a lot. I learned a lot tonight. I mean, one of the things I learned is that it's complicated, that there's no simple answers to this, and there's no simple solutions that uh, are, are going to be rolled out. But what I'm really inspired by is all of you, the level of engagement, the level of questions, um, and just the, the overall engagement tonight, the fact that there's so many of you here. And uh, that, that gives me hope. If, if, if nothing else does, that gives me hope that you guys are going to figure this out, and we need to be there to help you. So thank you all very much for coming up, and uh, I, I really appreciate it. So um, I'm going to hang out for a few more minutes, and I think our panelists will as well. If folks um, had a question that you didn't get a chance to ask and you'd like to come up and continue the dialogue, and also amongst yourselves, and I encourage you to continue the conversation going amongst yourselves. We really just scratched the surface. There's a lot more we could have talked about tonight. So please keep it going, and thanks, everybody, for coming out.